has published extensively in the areas of Dead Sea Scrolls and Jesus and his world. He's participated in archaeological excavations in, in Israel. He's a member of SBL and Society of New Testament Studies. He's an ordained minister in the United Methodist Church. He serves as advisor to the denomination's World Missionary Council. He preaches and lectures globally. We are indeed privileged to have him here tonight. Would you welcome him, James Charlesworth. There was a young teacher, and he said, no one in the world has ever seen what I'm about to see. None of you have ever seen it. And he popped out of his pocket a peanut, broke the husk, showed it to the congregation, and put it in his mouth. Today, I'm going to show you near the end what no Qumran scholar, what no Dead Sea Scroll scholar knows about so I'll be able to show you something that the specialist on the Dead Sea Scrolls have never seen. Would you be interested in seeing that? Yes. Uh, I think it's very important. You and I follow Jesus. And it's not an idea. It's a real person. He lived at a particular time and a particular place. And he did things that were particular for our salvation. That is my paradigm of particularity. Now what we're going to do is enter into that world and ask some questions about where did his followers, where did his Jewish colleagues, where did people find God's word? I've organized this into four questions. First. Did Jesus know a closed canon? Or was he influenced by many of the works that we have just found? And many of them are not in our canon. Many of them are among the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's our first question. Is it a good one? Our second question is, what documents assigned to the New Testament Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha that is, gospels and apocalypses and letters and epistles that circulated for hundreds of years beginning sometime after Jesus. Are there any of those that should be added as an appendix to our Christian canon? Is that a good question? The third question I want to share with you is what sacred documents define New Testament theology? And is that tantamount to a canon? Fourth, did any of those composing works in the canon or compositions eventually not included in our canon imagine they were creating sacred books full of God's word? I won't ask you if you think that's a good one. We all know it is. Was Jesus influenced by works in our canon? I'm son, not in our canon. Especially many writings among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now you know the New Testament is a selection of Jesus' life. All of you can quote the end of John and many other things Jesus said and did, but I'm not going to tell you about them. Well, maybe we will get a glimpse of some of those except for one exception. And we will see it. Jesus quoted authoritatively only from books in our canon. I'll say it again. When you read all of the sayings of Jesus, when he quotes God's word, when he quotes scripture, Every one of them, with one exception, is in our canon. It is certain that Jesus' knowledge and his theology was shaped not only by the canon, which was not closed, but also by the Jewish thoughts and writings that were circulating and being composed during his time. 
Before we turn to these texts, we should recognize there's a new perspective sweeping our globe. If we wish to know the mind of Jesus and his followers, we must read what has been discovered recently and not known to the reformers or subsequent theologians. The compositions are not recent. They are recently found. We may now only summarize how these ancient sacra scriptura, sacred scriptures, are important for understanding Jesus. Just a little glimpse. Uh, Jesus was itinerant. He moved around. He didn't sit in a synagogue. He's obviously being thrown out of synagogues. He's out there moving around. And as he moved around, he discussed it with a tremendous passion with many types of Jews, especially the Baptist groups. <laughs> Up and down the Jordan Rift Valley, we know about many groups. Jesus led a Baptist group. John, his cousin, led a Baptist movement. And there are many others. He also talked with many types of Pharisees, many types of Samaritans, the Enoch-oriented Jews, and various types of Essenes, as we know from so many writings today. He's moving around, and he's learning. But of course, you and I know there are other ways he's learning too, but that's not what we're doing now. There is abundant evidence to show that Jesus imagined he was a prophet. His main teaching is to announce the emphasis and the explosion of God's kingdom into the present. Thy kingdom come on earth. If you know anything about Jesus, hold on to that. And then you'll understand the commandments. Do unto others as I have done unto you. Jesus had great dreams, and the dreams are what have shaped the founding of America and its founding the resurgence of our culture today. His dream came from apocalyptic eschatology. Now that dream is in Nuche, in Isaiah 1 through 66, and in Daniel. But we now have so many apocalypses the apocalypse of Enoch, the apocalypse of Elijah, Elijah, the apocalypse of Abraham, so forth and so on. We can name over 12 apocalypses, and I must say, none of you would have passed an exam on any of them. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is urge you to read two of them. The first one is the fourth book of Ezra. It reached its recognized form sometime after the burning of the temple. When I read it, I think the author has the smoke from the burning of the temple in his nostrils. It's the great book on theodicy ever written. Oh, Adam, what have you done? Because the fall was not yours alone but each of us who are born from you. Very powerful. Oh, Adam, what have you done? Oh, Adam, what have you done? And now you heard the concept of a fall is not a Christian creation. It is there in a Jewish apocalypse. As this was passed on, the... Jewish author was translated into Latin and Syriac. He frequently refers to Philius Meus, my son. Philius Meus, my son. God refers to the coming of Philius Meus. As it was passed on from century to century, Christians added Philius Meus Jesus, my son Jesus. And also Philius Meus Christus, Every one of you passes with an A-plus 
Latin exams. You didn't know your Latin was so good. Filius meus Christus, my son Christ. Now you know this was passed on by Christians. So they think it's a Christian book. And in its present form, it's a very deep Christian book. It's extremely important when this author talks about the future. What is the future? Has Eden been opened again? Can we get back into Eden? Now the second apocalypse is even more important. It's the parables of Enoch. Sometimes I refer to it as written by an Einstein of antiquity. Einstein lived a block away from where my office is, so maybe that's kind of a personal connection. But this was a Jew. Einstein was a Jew. This man was a real genius. And uh, certainly if there's a genius that in our mind, we'd think it'd be Einstein. Now, I'm going to tell you that Jesus was influenced by this writing. Most leading scholars that read it and know it and are also gifted in studying Jesus and doing Jesus research, which is a term I gave to the academy, let's do some Jesus research. I don't like the idea of the quest of the historical Jesus. We never lost him. Now, Jesus was influenced by the parables of Enoch. First of all, it was being composed just before Jesus or during his ministry. Okay? Same time. It's the same time of Judaism that Jesus espouses. Theocentric, there's only one God. Apocalyptic, the present is full of new revelations, eschatological. This time is very important. Now, how do I know that? Well, Jesus moved around. He's meeting with these men. I'm not arguing that he read the book. I know he knows the book. You say, oh, come on, tell us the facts. Okay, we've worked through the Old Old Testament. God is the judge. I can quote over and over again, you can too. When I come as judge, I will condemn the wicked because I am the Lord, your God. You know it. Now, if you read through the Dead Sea Scrolls, God is the judge and he will come to judge us. If you read through all of the Apocrypha, it's the same thing. Same thing in Philo, same thing in Josephus. In summary, everywhere God is judge. You say, well, that's kind of nice. I knew it. Good. Because Jesus says, the Son of Man will come to judge. You say, I remember that. I remember that. The only writing that makes that shift is the parables of Enoch. Let me read from the third parable in the parables of Enoch. Now, You'll say, gosh, I hear the gospel. Okay, don't, don't get too carried away yet. Yeah, still time. And the Son of Man sat on the throne of his glory. And the whole judgment was given to the Son of Man. And he will make sinners vanish and perish from the face of the earth. And those who led the world astray will be bound in chains. And in the assembly place of the destruction, they will be confined. The Son of Man. All judgment is given to him. This was written during the... We don't know if it's just before Jesus was born or when he was 10 years old or when he began his ministry. It doesn't matter. It's what's in the air. If there was CNN or Fox News, whew, you know, take the one you want and throw the other one away. <laughs> if there was a cable network... Ladies and gentlemen, we've got some breaking news. Breaking news. Now, after the uh, advertisement, uh, this interval, we'll pick up the good news. <laughs> and what is the good news? We have met a man, Jesus, and he's been talking with Essenes, and he says, I couldn't believe it. They're right. There is a person called the Son of Man, and he is the one that God wants to judge. And then you have the text I just read. And the Son of Man sat on the throne of his glory, 
and the whole judgment was given to the Son of Man. Now, as I said, Jesus may not have read the work. If you think he did, that's fine too. But he certainly could have discussed it with those who were composing the parables of Enoch. Now, I don't have to quote the New Testament. You have, you have Matthew pretty much memorized when the Son of Man comes in judgment and, and the judgment was given to the Son of Man. You understand that point. And as a historian, I have to ask, where did Jesus get this idea? Now, you have two options. One is God took him and said, Son, yes, Father. Well, that's the way they talked. I want you to learn that I've given judgment to the Son of Man. Well, Father, that's a wonderful idea. But who is the Son of Man? Aha! That's another story, isn't it? Now I want to turn to the Dead Sea Scrolls. People have been working on Jesus in the Dead Sea Scrolls, especially since they were discovered and hit the pages of all our newspapers and our radios before there were TVs. Today we can report that most scholars have acknowledged that mutatis mutandis, Jesus was influenced by the Essenes. I'm going to give you two examples. And let me tell you the criteria. We're not going to expect Jesus to read a scroll. We're going to expect it to be something that's public that you don't have to read a scroll, but it's a kind of rule or legislation or a kind of a folklore or a kind of practice that people would observe. And people would say, he must be an Essene. The second thing is, the saying must clearly go back to Jesus. And the third thing, it must be absolutely unique to the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's why if we can find anything that's in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but is also in the Apocrypha, Pseudepigrapha, in the Old Testament, in, in the Septuagint, in Philo and Josephus, we can't discuss it. We have to find, you see, it's a lot of work, isn't it? My first example is, Jesus said, but the very hairs of your head are numbered. Matthew 10, 29 to 31. The very hairs of your head are numbered. Boy, I tell you, if we were in class with Jesus, we would raise our hand and say, who counts them and why would he count them? Now, for the first time, I can explain it to you. Either Jesus is having a very bad day or a scribe had no idea what he was doing or we need to find a context for this text so it becomes rich with meaning. The hairs of your head are numbered. Now, that's a passive. In the New Testament, when you have a passive and no clear actor, it is always God. The hairs of your head have been numbered by God. Now, you say, well, I know that. I have that all memorized. No, no sparrow falls. Good for you. You remember the passage. No sparrow falls without your father's concern. And your father has even counted every hair of your head. Okay, we know what it means now. Why would Jesus say, God has already counted the hairs of your head? Well, digging and exploring. I find in the Damascus document, in a fragment found in cave four, a statement that seems really exciting. Now the priest shall order, and they will shave the head of the sick man, but the bad part, they shall not shave, so that the priest may count the hair and see what is wrong with the person. Jesus is the first reformer. This text makes good sense. Now, how would he see it? Well, if you were walking through the hills of Galilee and you saw a young man or a man with a shaved head, you would say, what's that all about? I've never seen that before because men do not shave their heads. You say, well, haven't you seen what Michael Jordan... 
we're, we're not in the modern era. To shave your head, that's not what men do. So it would be very obvious. Why did you shave your head? So that I can go to the priest and he will tell me what's wrong with my, my scalp. Good. And Jesus says, don't go to the priest. God has already counted your hair. Now, I went to the library and I checked every single commentary. Matthew 10, nothing in German, nothing in French, nothing in Italian. All they tell us about sparrows. Now a sparrow is a little bird. And sometimes a little bird falls down from a tree. And when we look below the tree, we found a dead bird with his feet in the air. <laughs> and I say, well, that is just wonderful, yeah. Told us what we knew as an eight-year-old. No one says, and their very hairs of your head are numbered. We know now it means God has numbered your hair. You don't have to go to a priest. That's why I say Jesus is the first reformer. You are free to go directly to God. And if you need any more proof of that, his name for God is Father. Now, he could have said, you know, I call God Father, but you call him Elohim. He didn't. He said, when you pray, say, Pater. Pater. Now, that's evocative in Luke, and that's the original. Oh, Father. Oh, Father. So the beautiful thing about Jesus, his unique relationship to God, he gives to you in a prayer. And that is a model for prayer, and all of us make a mistake. It's a model for prayer. I turn now to another Dead Sea Scroll that I know Jesus was influenced by. One day, uh, Jesus asked, that's again Matthew 12, 11. He asked a very perplexing question. Uh, what one of you, those among us, well, if he has one animal, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath day, will not lay hold of it and, and help it out? Well, that's pretty stupid. I have never met anybody that said, you know, one of my cattle fell into the uh, ditch over here and I just didn't do any work to help that animal. The rule is always that life, saving life, is superior to any rule whatsoever. So there wouldn't be anybody that I can think of. No Jew that ever lived would say, just leave it in the ditch. So again, we have a problem. Jesus was drinking, drinking too much wine. Jesus had a migraine. Jesus doesn't make sense and just leave it alone. That was what we were taught early on in the 16th century, but not all of us were alive then. If you have a problem in the text, just leave it alone. Oh, no, that's what we want to do. We want to take seriously every passage of the New Testament. And Jesus, we are going to examine your mind because we're going to follow you whatever you think, but I'd like you to think something that's thinkable and make wise. So Jesus says, hey, is there anybody in this room? You can stand up and scream, I would. <laughs> now, I've never allowed people to do that, but uh, let's assume I didn't ask you to do that because we may have some people here that need a little more help than I can give them. <laughs> imagine, imagine, you know, that in some place, Anywhere, there is a person that says, I think the Sabbath is very important. We must not do any work. And if an animal falls into the pit, too bad. No, I've never met anybody. So Jesus, what are you talking about? What are you imagining? Now we have to find a text. The text has to talk about the Sabbath. The text has to say if an animal falls into a pit. So we have to have Sabbath, animal, and pit. And it says you must leave him there because you mustn't do anything that's a work. Now, you can get the mind, we mustn't do anything to violate the Sabbath. Guess what I found in cave four? No, actually, this is uh, 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 an earlier, uh, a fuller text. Listen to me, please. Let no one Deliver the young of an animal on Shabbat, on the Sabbath day, 
And if it falls into a pit or a ditch, let him not raise it on Shabbat, on the Sabbath. The teaching is unique to the Essenes. According to Josephus, they're in every city. Now, maybe you haven't lived in Jerusalem and, and realized that beginning at 3 o'clock on Friday, people are running home. Then you don't hear a car. You don't drive. You don't hear a radio. It must be quiet. Which means in Jesus' time, on the Sabbath, far away, you could hear an animal call for its life. And I can, it's public. He doesn't have to read a text. And Jesus would say, well, what's that all about? And you could then imagine uh, the Sabbath. Uh, man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath for man. Jesus is taught by God. He is our Savior. And by these insights, we begin to realize he was like us in every way as a human being. He became like us. Now, I don't have time to do it, but there are many, many passages. Those are the negatives. A lot of people conclude, looking at a partial vat, a data, Jesus cannot be an Essene. Other people say, I'll look at other things, and Jesus was an Essene. The Essenes created the concept of the sons of light. Jesus refers to it many times in the New Testament. The best one is John 12. Walk in the light while you have the light that you don't walk in darkness so that you can become sons of light. You all said it with me. Good for you. Walk in the light so that you can become now, if the Essenes created that, Jesus takes it and finds it to be very important. Who wouldn't want to say, wow, that's a great idea. I want to walk in the light. And then it goes on, so I do not perish, but have everlasting life. Throughout the Old Testament, or Hebrew Aramaic scriptures, we hear about the Holy Spirit of God, God's Holy Spirit. Beginning with the Dead Sea Scrolls, we hear about the Holy Spirit. There's a big difference between God's Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, and the Holy Spirit from God. The Holy Spirit from God. Now, we know the Essenes developed that because when they left Jerusalem, they felt that the Spirit had gone with them. And when they got to the ruins of a fort from about the time of Isaiah, Jeremiah. They knew they were the holy ones, Kiddoshim. Some were Kiddoshe Kiddoshim, the holy of holy ones. And why is that? Because they lived in the Baith Kodesh, the house of holiness. And why are they the holy ones living in the house of holiness? Because the Holy Spirit had left the temple and was in their midst. Now, there are many others that we can talk about. Jesus, in Matthew, blesses those who are celibate for the kingdom of heaven. The only celibate group we know are the Essenes living at Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found and will continue to be found. Now, the Christian canon. We've talked about Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls. What documents in the Apocryphal New Testament should be in an appendix of the Christian canon? First of all, let me say, no way are we going to add these books. The Gospel of Peter, a lot of people want it added. No. It is not so early as people demand. It is second century. And it should not be in our canon because it is full of fables and fairy tales. No one in the New Testament tells you how the resurrection occurs. But if you listen to this author, the angels come down and they move the stone. Jesus walks out and he scratches his head on the, on the heavens and the cross comes walking after him. You know we've left history and gone into mythology. No way. 
The Acts of John. Oh, no way should it be added. John is sitting up on the Mount of Olives, and many of us have been there. And he was looking down at Jesus being crucified, and, and great tears came in from his eyes. And he, he says, oh, this is terrible. And the man walks up and puts his hand on his shoulder, and he says, John, don't be upset. What is occurring down there is an illusion. And he says, oh, Jesus, I don't want that in my Bible. Jesus died on that cross and he died if you'll forgive me I'm a Methodist minister and I'm surrounded by angels Baptists <laughs> I feel at home there's a meaning in his death we may never be able to explain it that's not what we're supposed to do we can experience it. We can feel it. And most of all, we can say, thank you, thank you. The Acts of John. The Gospel of Judas, I'm sorry. I don't want to spend much time on that. Uh, when the New York Times called me and said we're doing a special on the uh, uh, Gospel of Ju uh, Judas, I said, well, first of all, let me make a point. Judas had nothing to do with it. It was hundreds of years later. Judas did not write it. And I heard him scream to the typist, stop, kill the story. That's why it never appeared in the New York. It's no way. Now let me tell you some writings that will help you grow. Come closer to God and feel the power of Jesus' message. The first one is the Odes of Solomon. We don't know whether it's Jewish or originally Christian. I have tried to show for 40 years, and I've been pretty successful, that it was written by a Jew that became then a follower of Jesus, considered him the Messiah, and lived in the Gospel of John's community and influenced the final writing of the Gospel of John. We will look at that. It's very much like the Joannine epistles. The Lord is on my head like a crown. The Coptic, the choice, echen ta'ape and tehe enuklom. The Lord is on my head like a crown, but it's a wreath. Is he thinking about the crown of thorns? He's a poet. And I shall never be outside him. I will never be away from him. He is the Lord. The Lord Jesus is on my head like a crown. I want that in my Bible it, as an appendix. The Gospel of Thomas, yes, that has to be added in the appendix because many of the parables are preserved there that we don't know about and some of them have a good chance of going back in a pre-edited form to Jesus. If we're interested in the parables of Jesus, we have to look at the Gospel of Thomas. The dating of that is very notorious. I would say sometime after 110, maybe after 130, but not too late because the writing down of tradition doesn't date a tradition. The infancy gospel of James. Ah, oh, this is a beautiful one. Professor Zervos is working on a two-volume monograph for my series. And he has convinced many scholars that the reference to the temple is so positive and that when Mary, she's a dancing girl in the temple, we didn't think that was possible. And now the top Jewish scholars working on the remains of the temple and working on traditions about the temple say, this makes sense. This seems to be from the time when girls danced in the temple. You would say, dancing, you go to hell. Read about David dancing. Did you ever dance for joy? That's what we're talking about. Uh, uh, there's a good dancing, dancing, celebrating. Uh, David danced in the temple. Young girls danced in the temple. So I would want that one in. Uh, Edgerton too. that's a good candidate. Uh, it is very early. Uh, in many ways, it's earlier than what we have as witnesses to Mark and John and Matthew and Luke. Um, here is a passage that I'd like you to have as an appendix. Search the scriptures in which you think you have life. 
It is they which bear witness to me. Well, I'd like to have that in my appendix. Now, as we've been trying to show you for several days now, it's a reference to scriptures. What's the list? What's in? What's out? We don't know. Oxyrhynchus 840. I am clean, for I have bathed in the pool of David and have gone down by one staircase and come up by the other, and I have put on clean white clothes. This is a saying of Jesus. Jesus would never have been able to go into the temple until he went into a mikvah. And the mikvah oat we have excavated in the last few years have a step down, a divider, and a step back. And that's exactly what this man says. I've gone down on one side and up on the other. Let's have it there. Maybe it goes back to Jesus. Jesus said, I am clean. For I have bathed in the pool of David and have gone down by one staircase and come up by the other. I think the gospel of truth may perhaps be added. I'm very moved by the statement, the gospel of truth is a joy to those who know it. I want Christians to be joyful. I want people to pour in the church because that's where you found real joy. I want us not to go around saying, I'm a sinner, I'm no good. I should be sent to hell. I want us to say, I feel marvelous. Wouldn't you like to feel like that? I'm getting a joy, a joy. And everybody in this room knows the joy of experiencing Jesus, the joy of not being condemned. In fact, that may be the greatest strength of Christian theology. You are no longer condemned by yourself. And each of us kick ourselves all the time. Charles Worth, what's wrong with you? Well, I don't have time to list all that, you know. Now, what sacred documents define New Testament theology? And that is tantamount to a canon. What I want to do is turn to one little passage. It's the epistle of Jude. Listen to me as I read verses 14 and 15. You say, what chapter? Aha, you don't know it. It's only one chapter. <laughs> the author of Jude 14 and 15. And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of thee, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all they are ungodly among them of all their, un of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against. It is an attribution to a document. You know that. And Enoch also, the second from Adam, prophesied. The author of Jude says he has a document that was connected with Enoch, maybe written by Enoch, and it's a prophetusen, aorist, prophecy. You can hear it in the Greek, a prophetusen. You can hear the prophecy. Wouldn't it be nice if we had that document? Maybe we should keep looking. We found it. We found it in an Aramaic fragment from the time of Herod the Great. And it's exactly this portion. So we know that Jude has in his canon a document that you heard about maybe for the first time. The books of Enoch. Now, I want to turn to the Odes of Solomon. Did any of those composing works in the non-canonical, to use that term, imagine they were creating or preserving God's words? Except for Paul's letters and some other epistles, the New Testament authors intermittently give you the idea that they are writing Scripture. Certainly John thought he was. He who has heard me has heard the Father. What I say, I don't say of my own authority. What I hear the Father speak, I say to you, that is sacred scripture. The author who wrote that knew that for his community and the earliest followers of Jesus, Jesus was the canon. 
Now my friend Lee McDonald will develop that a little more, and I enjoyed conversations with him. As Professor Vermish of Oxford said, Jesus as a miracle, miracle worker was the axis mundi. It's where fire of heaven touched the earth, and the power went out, and he healed, and he did wonderful deeds. Also in terms of the canon, who, not what is the canon, Jesus is the canon. What Jesus thinks, what Jesus says, that is what God wants us to know. Now, I want to turn now to the oldest. It's the earliest Christian hymn book. Listen to this. I want this to be in your appendix. Rise up and stand erect. You who once were brought low. You who have been in silence, speak, for your mouth has been opened. You who were despised from henceforth be lifted up, for your righteousness, cap R, has been lifted up. A paranomasia about being lifted up on the cross. You who have been downcast, be lifted up, because your righteousness has been lifted up. Only in John does upsotheo mean be lifted up on the cross. Now, I can't read all of this. Uh, I'm not even going to read the summary. I want to get back to our youth. Wouldn't that be nice? Oh, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. Oh, we sang it so well, didn't we? Yes, that's the book for me. As wonderful as those early days were, we tended to make the Bible an object of focus. We tended to worship the Bible and carry it with us to church. It became too much like an idol. Now, you know in the Bible it says, you shall not, second commandment, you shall not make any graven image in the heavens above and the water, in the earth beneath or the waters under the earth. You shall not bow down and serve them. Far too often, you and I are guilty of making the Bible an idol. What's wrong with that? Well, don't forget that Samuel Taylor Coleridge said so brilliantly, bibliolatry, the worship of the Bible, bibliolatry is a form of idolatry. The Bible doesn't want us to worship it. It is that magnificent window from here to where we long to go. Now, I'm going to try to share with you some conclusions. We have not found any passages where Jesus clearly quoted, quoted authoritatively from anything that's not in our canon. That's our first. That's a big discovery. Second, compositions co composed by or edited by the early Christians should be read carefully and meditatively as we seek to draw closer to Jesus who descended from the hills of Nazareth and to the hearts and minds of so many here today. Third, we can talk about New Testament theology. The books canonized were very influential and quoted in them. But not, let us forget Jude quotes from the books of Enoch, and we have an Aramaic fragment from that exact passage. Fourth, there are documents that didn't make it into the canon that record God's will and God's word. As we know, the author of John knew about many things that Jesus said, but he did not tell us them. Let's remember Strickland Gilliland. I think God kept on talking when his book had gone to press, that God continues speaking to the listening souls of us. I think God's voice is busy yet to teach and guide and bless that every time we ask for light, 
God calls to us again. Now, the canon is a rule. Kane in Hebrew means rule. You go out into the wilderness, you cut a reed length, and you now have a kane, a rule, uh, and now you can get the kind of uh, garment you want, the silk you want. And the Bible is a rule given to you so that you know when you look at the sunset or the sunrise or hear Mozart, you can say, applying the rule that I've learned from our closed canon, no one should ever open it. It's there. It's been there for a long while. And it's not our task. Any of us, doesn't matter where we are teaching, we need to realize it's a measuring stick so we can see God's love in the eyes of others. So you become part of the canon. We see it, God's word, in many books written by people you love, your pastors, and in the sermons we often hear but most importantly, in the souls of those we love or maybe those we met for the first time. The canon opens to us wonders around us that help us understand the inscribed words so that every time we ask for light, God calls to us again. Uh, he is Emeritus President and Professor of New Testament Studies at Acadia Divinity College and Dean of the Faculty of Theology at Acadia University in Nova Scotia. He's authored and edited uh, over 30 books. Welcome to the pulpit now. Lee McDonald, please. Uh, uh, it's a delight to be with you in this beautiful setting, and we got a wonderful tour of the library a little earlier, and uh, Craig had invited uh, Jim and me to come and to share in the areas of canon, canon formation. And I'm going to piggyback. Jim talked so much about uh, the significance of canon and that Jesus is canon. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we got it and some of the processes that uh, came about uh, there. A few years ago, and uh, over a number of years, I think I've spent uh, 29 years on, an or on various ordination councils. I chaired three of them. And I was the chief examiner for the ordination council when I was in Nova Scotia. I was president of the seminary, and by virtue of that office, they always had the seminary president uh, ask all of the tough questions to the ordinands who were coming forward for ordination. <clears throat> and this is in the Baptist tradition, which, as you know, uh, I've been asked a little bit about it. Don't you know when the Baptists were started? Of course they do. I said, they didn't go back to John the Baptist or Jesus. We go back to Abraham when he said, you go your way and I'll go mine. Those of you who are Baptists, <clears throat> those of you who are Baptists understand that very, very well. At any rate, uh, at the ordination councils, I would often get around when we were dealing with Scripture and I would ask them their views of Scripture. And it would invariably be, and they'd have this nice little phrase that they would say at these ordination councils, the, the Bible is the final word of authority in all matters of faith and practice. Have you ever heard that kind of a thing before? Yes. So I generally would ask him, would you open up your Bible to Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Jesus said, all authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I said, Jesus said, all authority is given unto me. Could you tell me when he transferred his authority to the Bible? And they said, ooh. You're not supposed to ask that question. <laughs> At any rate, I said, the point I was trying to make is the Bible, as Jim has said uh, rightly, we do not worship the Bible. We worship the one the Bible points us to. The Bible is a derived authority. It's not the final authority, but it points us to the one. And we don't know who he is until we get into the scriptures. But that's a part of where I think it's very important. Uh, my thesis tonight, I'm going to make a couple of comments in reference to it, that the New Testament uh, texts functioned as Scripture before they were called Scripture. 
They didn't initially, when they were written, except perhaps some of the Gospels, uh, they didn't function that way for a period of time, but then the value of them began to manifest itself in congregations. And so all of our New Testament texts were used like Scripture before they were ever called Scripture. They begin to be called Scripture about 130 to 150 A.D., and then there's a broader collection of them that are called Scripture, uh, the Gospels especially, and letters of Paul, some of the letters of Paul, not all, uh, by about 180 to 200, along with uh, the book of Acts and also uh, 1 uh, Peter and 1 John. The Christians did not welcome, however, the same books at the same time. When one congregation said, we really like the Gospel of John, that doesn't mean every church everywhere uh, said, yeah, we do too. In fact, at the earliest churches, they didn't all have the Gospel of John. They had a different Gospel. Most churches did not have all four of the Gospels. That took quite some time. And only a few people would have had all four, like Irenaeus uh, coming up toward the end of the uh, second century, about 170 to 180. Uh, he knew all four Gospels, and he said, these four and no more. And uh, some of the folks would think, well, what Irenaeus said was certainly true for everybody. Not at all. Uh, most of the Christians probably didn't even know some of the other Gospels at that particular period of time. That's a long time in process. Some non-biblical texts also, and, and uh, uh, Dr. Charlesworth has also s uh, focused on that a little bit, functioned as Scripture, and I'll give some examples of those, well into the 1800s. One of them in particular that was very popular in the uh, Catholic tradition was the uh, third Corinthians and it was a part of the uh, scriptures of the Armenian Christians up until about 1850 uh, and a number of folks say well gee what was wrong with them well nothing was wrong with them they found it to be rather rather fruitful the Germans found for almost 900 years the epistle of the Laodiceans to be very helpful and then eventually it was excluded, but they, all the Christians didn't act in one accord on recognizing all of their scriptures at the same time. And uh, just because once in a while somebody says, well, a church father said this on this particular occasion, therefore everybody in the Greco-Roman world believed the same thing at the same time. Well, that's absurd, of course. It's like me saying, I speak for all Christians today. And everything that I'm saying here, all of you will agree with. No, that uh, I won't go that far. But you should, no. It, uh, <laughs> the canonization processes took centuries before there was broad agreement on uh, the scope of our New Testament canon. Um, the major bodies of Christians today accept all 27 books of the New Testament. But not that didn't happen immediately. And when the canons were beginning to be uh, put together, canon lists of the books that comprise the New Testament, uh, uh, when it first began to list the 27 books of the New Testament, uh, Athanasius was one of the earliest to do that in uh, 367 in his 39th festal letter uh, that he would tell people when to celebrate Easter. That was what the festal letter was all about. Uh, he often would add a few other things uh, to it, and so he made this list of the New Testament scriptures. He did the Old Testament ones as well, and generally those of us in more conservative circles, I like Athenaeus's New Testament, 27 books. He was the very first to say he thought Second Peter was scripture. Second Peter was largely ignored up to that period of time. And uh, after Athanasius, many other Christians began to cite it. But not everybody, and you won't find it in an awful lot of the canon lists that uh, circulated in early Christianity and for several centuries. Those kinds of things are something we should get into the habit of knowing not everybody thought the same thing at the same time. There did come a time when there was broad consensus, and I shared last night at the university, there was a time when all churches knew exactly which books were in their Old Testaments. But they don't all agree on which books are in their Old Testament. The Protestants have the shortest one, and they followed the Hebrew Bible canon, and uh, yet not in the same order as the Hebrew Bible. Uh, I mentioned last night, it's quite possible that the Christians have an earlier order of their books, uh, the uh, Pentateuch, the history books, the law and the, pro I'm sorry, the uh, 
uh, poetry and, and uh, wisdom literature, and then the prophets. Uh, that may possibly be earlier than the Tanakh, the uh, Torah uh, law, and then the Nevi'im, the prophets, and then the writings. At any rate, the canonization processes took a long time, uh, centuries in fact, before there was broad agreement. But as late as Martin Luther on the New Testament canon, you all know this, you Lutherans who are here, he didn't have much use for the book of Hebrews or James because he thought it competed with Paul or Jude or the book of Revelation. He even said they should be thrown in the river Elba. Now, in my church background, throwing the book of Revelation away, oh, that was too much in there. It's, uh, and uh, having been a pastor also, there's too many wonderful texts in there that I love to share at funeral services. I don't want to throw the book of Revelation away. But Luther didn't have much use for it. The first New Testament manuscripts with all of the books in them and no others that now comprise our 27 books date from the 9th to the 10th century A.D. Isn't that amazing that it took that long? Now, there's some other collections that had all of the books in the New Testament, but some others as well. Codex Sinaiticus, which I saw in the library, has all of the 27 books of the New Testament in it, but it also adds the Epistle of Barnabas and the Shepherd of Hermas. Both were very popular books among the early Christians, and for centuries uh, thereafter. I won't go through all of these, but these are some of the major topics that I had. I'm going to skip through a couple of them. The primary canon, and Jim said it very beautifully. He stole it from me because I shared it with him at breakfast time. <coughs> anyway, <laughs> but uh, far be it for me to tell the eminent uh, James Charlesworth, <coughs> Jesus was the first canon of the church. And uh, there's no question about that. Uh, we wouldn't have a New Testament if it weren't for Jesus. And... Uh, the first canon, and I mentioned the Matthew 28, 19 passage of Scripture, all authority is given unto me. Jesus was a canon, and the canon itself meant it came to mean not just measuring, uh, a measuring stick, it came to mean that which qualified as a model to follow. And uh, the measuring to follow for the Christian family is Jesus. He was the model that we follow. And uh, Romans 10, 9 is that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is... Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the shortest and the earliest confessional statement that's found in the New Testament. The core of the New Testament writings, of course, were Jesus' death, his resurrection, and the exaltation. There's some other things in there besides that, but that was the nuts and bolts of it. Without that, we wouldn't have a New Testament. All of the books in the New Testament make an assumption about Jesus' resurrection. He came alive after he was crucified and buried. In Romans 1, 3, and 4, he was designated Son of God with power by the resurrection of the, uh, his, uh, his resurrection from the dead. He is the presupposition for the New Testament canon. So without Jesus, there is no such thing as a New Testament canon. Uh, the term canon was not used regularly in the church uh, until much, much later, uh, actually in the 1700s, but it's first used uh, by Athanasius for the collection of books in 367 A.D., but it wasn't a very popular term to use at that time. There are a number of others that were shared in uh, uh, one of the papers I heard yesterday, and I thought it was very good because it focused on that, that area. But some of the texts about Jesus... I put Q. Some of you are familiar with the term Q. It's a German term, Kella, that means source. And uh, the sources that are found in uh, the sayings of Jesus in Matthew and Luke but are not found in Mark or any, uh, anywhere else. James Dunn, in his book, Jesus Remembered, has said, uh, and I think rightly so, that some of the things that were said about Jesus, he was a popular person. He said remarkable things. No one taught like him. Crowds followed him, and he did miraculous things as well. And so uh, some of the things that were said about Jesus were probably written down before he died, and they were later incorporated in the Gospels that we currently have today. I got that thought from James uh, Dunn, and it made so much more sense about what Q is than what I had heard before, and I appreciate it. But why were the New Testament scriptures written? 
Uh, first of all, of course, the Gospels want to tell the story. Mark lets us know that uh, the beginning and the, uh, the Gospel itself begins with the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And some of the texts say the Son of God. Uh, I go with it stopping the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news about Jesus Christ. And they tell the story of Jesus, the Lord of the church. The book of Acts uh, continues that story. Interestingly, the book of Acts was not initially separated from the Gospel of Luke, and Luke wants his good news about Jesus to continue all the way. That good news goes all the way to Rome. And so Paul uh, proclaims the good, the good news of the Gospel. The letters themselves address generally specific situations that were facing churches in specific locations. They are what we call ad hoc letters. So the why Paul wrote a letter, there was quite often uh, in lieu of a visit or because he heard there was a problem going on in the church. And so when he wrote a letter, many of his letters have, they start with kind of a historical nutshell to give you a clue as what's going on and then a theological base and then they conclude with the practical implications of that theological base for Christian living. Uh, you can break down most of the books that uh, Paul wrote in that regard. The book of Revelation, written I think in the uh, late first century, dealt with some crises that the churches were facing. Some were pa facing persecution in Asia Minor. Some were rather lethargic, like Laodicea. Some were looking for hope, and some needed a kick in the pants, and that's the warning part that was there. And the book of Revelation gives all of that. Uh, but why was the, Revela uh, the New Testament written again in general to tell the story of Jesus and the implications of Jesus' life, his fate, what happened to him in his death and resurrection, the implications of that for faith and for mission for all who have chosen to follow him. Uh, the purpose was to clarify the church's core beliefs, their mission, their identity, their appropriate conduct. We still go to the Bible today for those very same reasons. It was to also to address church conflicts. And there were some churches, and you don't have to look very far in Corinthian church to find some of the conflicts. And Paul gets mad at them right at the beginning in a couple of places, and he has a lot of irony in Second uh, Corinthians as well. I'll say something about uh, uh, that in a little bit and also to, uh, to address issues of heresy that were growing up within the church. And they were written to encourage new followers of Jesus in their journeys of faith. Other things, uh, have many other things, as Jim shared a little bit ago, uh, are found in this book. Or many other things did Jesus that are not found written in this book, but these are written that you might believe and have life by believing in him. John 20, 30. Uh, 31. Uh, faith itself is not simply an uh, assent, a logical assent to a group of facts that are out there. There's some facts about Jesus we need to know, but faith in the essence of it, Paul speaks of it, is the obedience of faith, Romans 1, 5, and he praises the Romans for their obedience of faith. If there's no obedience of faith, Jesus is not your canon if you do not obey him. That's the point I think that uh, uh, Paul was trying to make. Uh, now, switching very quickly over to when did the New, New Testament writings function as Scripture? Now, that becomes a bit of a place where scholars love to argue, and uh, I think I'm the only one that's got it right. No, it, uh, <laughs> believe me, there are some others out there that don't think that I did. But for the Gospels, almost immediately, uh, the Gospels were looked upon as an authoritative book. Guess why? Because they told the story of the Lord of the church. And when the Gospels began to be quoted as scriptural texts, they didn't say, according to Matthew, Jesus said. They just said, Jesus said in a scriptural way. And that's true through most of the second century uh, A.D. And when... Uh, you get by the end of the second century A.D., the Gospels are beginning to be identified by name. But they were circulating in the churches, and most of the ones that were cited, most, the one most cited was Matthew by far. Matthew more than all of the, th the other three put together. But uh, they were called Scripture. Uh, the words of Jesus were called Scripture. It's not unlike when uh, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18, uh, has a quotation uh, and it comes from the book of Deuteronomy and also, and you, you can look it up on your own, also 
uh, from uh, Matthew chapter 10 and Luke uh, as well. Uh, that particular text is called a scripture, as the scripture says, and Jesus' words are being cited at that point. Not, it doesn't say, according to Matthew, <coughs> Jesus said. It doesn't say it quite like that. Initially, Jesus' words were cited as scripture, and later the gospels as gospels began to be called scripture themselves, about 130 to 150, but not everybody made that uh, uh, decision at the same time. Basilides, so interesting, was Gnostic, about 130, is the very first person that we know of to call three of the Gospels. He didn't cite Mark's Gospel, but he called them all Scripture. And we find that in the Hippolytus of Rome and his refutation of all heresies in its uh, uh, book 7 and uh, 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 chapters 24 and 25 and 26 and then several texts within there. Anyway, and he cites four of Paul's letters. Uh, Romans, uh, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and Ephesians. He rather liked those, and he actually called them Scripture. Uh, Paul's writings also began to be called Scripture. You see, even in the New Testament text, 2 Peter, and uh, scholars are all over the map on when 2 Peter was written. I'm one of those that thinks it's a second century text. And it used to be people would put it early in because they said the apocalypse of Peter quotes from 2 Peter. There's some new studies that have come out and said it looks like maybe uh, Second Peter, the author of Second Peter, not only uh, taking portions of the book of Jude out, uh, the letter of Jude, but also uh, that he may have depended upon the apocalypse uh, of Peter. And I'm more in favor of that. And I do think, however, and folks have said, well, are you willing to throw it out of the New Testament because it wasn't written by Peter? No, I'm not. Why? Because it has orthodox teaching within it. And uh, God had more talented children in the first couple of centuries than we're willing to give him credit for. Isn't that amazing? Where we want to limit the only people God could speak through. And the writer, the, those who coordinated the New Testament and included Luke and Mark knew those people were not apostles, but included their work in that as well. Now, the writings of Scripture, Revelation. Interestingly here, the author of Revelation, if you look in chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, and then uh, 22, verses 18 to 19, which says nobody, uh, and he's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 4, uh, verse 2, uh, you, anybody who takes from or adds to this book, to that person will be added the plagues or the uh, disasters that are mentioned throughout the book of Revelation. And he calls it in chapter 1, verses uh, 1 to 3, a revelation of God. That's the closest thing we have in New Testament that actually claims the writer, the John of Revelation, claims is a revelation of God. That's the closest thing we have to a scriptural reference. And interestingly, the only book in the New Testament that comes closest to being called scripture was the last to be accepted as scripture in the history of early Christianity. Isn't that interesting? Uh, the Gospels and Paul were often called scripture by about 180 to 200 A.D., and that was a growing group of Christians throughout the Greco-Roman world. They didn't all make those confessions at the same time, but they, many of them functioned that way, as we saw earlier, between about 130 to 150. There are some scholars, and I'll say something about them in a moment, who think that uh, they were consciously written as scripture uh, right from the get-go. Every New Testament writer thought he was writing sacred scripture. Uh, I often say, if that were true, why did it take the church fathers almost a hundred years to make that confession? That's another story. There's some books that took a little bit longer to be recognized as sacred scripture. Uh, the book of Hebrews, James, uh, uh, Second uh, Peter, Second and Third John, Jude, and Revelation. Uh, most of those were finished or welcomed by most of the Christians by the end of the fourth century, but some weren't for centuries thereafter, many centuries thereafter. Uh, the book of Revelation is now accepted in all of the major groups, the uh, Protestants, the Catholics, the uh, Orthodox, both Russian and Greek. They recognize the book of Revelation, but it's amazing how I've noticed in this country it's almost never found in any lectionary that the church produces even to this day, even though they acknowledge it as scripture. And uh, I have done a survey of how the book of Revelation is used. It, it is listed among their scriptures, but it's never used in a liturgy in the uh, Orthodox churches. Isn't that an interesting uh, move? 
The non-New Testament books, uh, some of them were welcome for centuries. Uh, Jim mentioned the uh, Odes of Solomon, uh, which actually are beautiful, beautiful hymns uh, that were written uh, about 100 to 125-ish uh, in that uh, department. And uh, those were cited as scripture as late as the early 4th century, like Tantius. Uh, there were several temporary scriptures that continued for a period of time and then eventually they were excluded. One of the most popular was the book of Hermas and the epistle of Her uh, uh, Barnabas. Uh, both of those were included in Codex Sinaiticus, one of the first two Bibles that we have that try to contain Old and New Testaments. And uh, you'll see a copy of Codex Sinaiticus over in the library here. It's a wonderful uh, text, but it concludes with the epistle of Barnabas and Shepherd of Hermas. Shepherd of Hermas is rejected in a text that I'll tell you about in a moment, uh, the Muratorian fragment. It's rejected as scripture, but it's also called upon to read it. And I think it was a transitionary time. There comes a time when people say, well, it's not scripture, so don't read it at all. They were encouraged to read it. It's called an ecclesiastical writing, but it wasn't considered a part of the canon. And that's probably closer to the end of the fourth century and fifth century than before. And that's why it's relevant uh, to mention that in the uh, 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 Muratorian fragment. Shepherd of Hermas, interestingly, it's one of three apocalypses that was very popular in early Christianity. And uh, the book, the Gospel of, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, book of Revelation uh, by John, whichever John, we're not exactly sure. It says it was written by John, and I take it as John, but there were more people than... One, we have a John Mark who wrote the uh, Gospel of Mark. There are all kinds of Johns in the first century. I don't think the John who wrote Revelation also wrote the Gospel of John or First and Second John and Third John. Uh, at any rate, the, uh, uh, that uh, uh, collection of writings, uh, Hermas was, uh, I mentioned the, the book of Revelation. I'm sorry, my tang got tangled up there. The book of Revelation, the Apocalypse of Peter, and Hermas. Those were the three most common apocalypses. That's not all of them that were there, but the three most common. And the one that we found more text to in antiquity of the, all of the manuscripts that have been discovered, 5740, there are more examples of the shepherd of Hermas and the manuscripts that have survived than any of the others, including the book of Revelation. Uh, that we have in our New Testament. So it was a very popular text. Also, First and Second Clement. Yesterday a paper was given, and I had known that First and Second Clement was cited in the 5th century and collect, uh, inserted among Christian scriptures, New Testament scriptures, but uh, there was a paper that was given yesterday over on the, the campus, uh, and the fellow cited 11th and 12th century references to uh, Hermas as uh, a sacred, uh, sacred text. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, first and second Clement. Anyway, uh, the debates continued well into the Reformation period, and I mentioned Luther, but also the largest biblical canon uh, that we have. It's a group of Christians who were separated from the rest of Christendom from about the uh, uh, fifth, uh, late fifth, early sixth century. They were probably started to the Christian community in Ethiopia by Syrian missionaries that came down. And their canon has 81 books in it. And the 81 varies a little bit here and there in the Gaia's language, but uh, they may have one of the earlier forms of a Christian canon that uh, predates some of the ones that we currently use today. Uh, the uh, Armenia also included uh, 3rd Corinthians until about 1850, but also the repose of the blessed disciple, which was John. And they read that uh, very commonly. And I served in an Armenian church, and the pastor loved those books. Uh, the epistle, I'm sorry, uh, Third Corinthians, and also the repose of the blessed disciple. And he would read them every now and then in the worship service. And I said, oh, that's different. Coming from my conservative background, he said, you shouldn't do that, you know. It's, uh, but he said that was a part of his scripture. Dating the New Testament took many centuries. It was not an easy thing to do. We have been blessed that we have a book that has all of our books in these books and no other books. But that wasn't true in early Christianity and for many centuries thereafter. Uh, the uh, 
HBU Bible Museum. I'm just putting a plug in there. I saw that the other day for the first time. That is a marvelous treat. If you haven't been over to the campus to see it, they've got some incredible Bibles in there, and uh, some that uh, I, I thought at first they were facsimiles, but they've got uh, the original uh, publication of some of those earlier Bibles. So I hope you get a chance to get over there. Now, uh, there's uh, a thorn of flesh for a number of people, and I call it the Achilles heel of canon, uh, New Testament canon formation. It makes some assumptions. The two assumptions are, uh, first of all, that the Muratorian fragment, and I'll say something about the, the fragment, the Muratorian fragment was the first to list a New Testament canon of books, a collection of books. And the other assumption is that it is a second century, late second century uh, uh, collection, and it also represents late second century thinking about the formation of the New Testament canon. It also was uh, believed to uh, reflect how the church dealt with heresy in its midst. And the primary heresies would have been Marcion, the uh, 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 Gnostics, and also the Montanists. But uh, that again has been dispelled over and over again. The early church did not deal with the heresies, uh, the second century church, with the heresies in their churches by appealing to a canon, a fixed canon, these books and no other books. That's simply not true. There's not one example of it. With the exception, people say, well, the Muratorian fragment did it. Therefore, if the Muratorian fragment did it, one person puts together a list, everybody everywhere must have believed the same thing as in the Muratorian fragment. Now, the issues have to do with the date, the author, and the provenance. We don't know who the author was, the provenance. People say either in the East, there's good arguments for the East, and in the West, there's good arguments for the West, and they think somewhere in the vicinity of Rome. The suggested dates among scholars is 180 to 200, 250, 300, 350 to 400, or even early 5th century. The problem is the Muratorian fragment, if it was a 2nd century text, it had absolutely no known influence and no parallels until the late 4th century. Nothing like it until the late 4th century. I mentioned two scholars in here, Verheiden and Guignard. Uh, they agree with that assessment, but they choose the 2nd century dating but I will show you why they're wrong. <laughs> anyway. uh, here's the fellow that uh, started it, and Moratori uh, found this in a library in uh, Milan, an Ambrosian library. It wasn't constructed there, but he found it in 1738 to 1740. And uh, during that uh, period of time, people began to study it, and in the 19th century and the 20th century, all kinds of views began to be focused on it. So the 7th or 8th uh, century uh, fragmented text likely translated from the Greek, though there's a number of scholars that think it uh, originated in very poor Latin. The Latin that it's in is very poorly done, and pretty much everybody agrees with that. Many scholars believe that it's a late 2nd century canon of New Testament books and the earliest canon of the New Testament scriptures likely originated in Rome. Its author is unknown, but its Latin is very poor. Pretty much everybody agrees with the poor Latin. Here are the popular arguments that it reflects widespread second century thinking about the New Testament canon, uh, that the early churches dealt with heresy by establishing the New Testament canon, that other scholars claim that it's a fourth century document, however, and I'll tell you the reasons why in just a moment. No one knows who wrote it, and it had no influence at all. It is quoted, actually, in the late 4th or early 5th century, and I'll give you the name of the guy who did it. But the 2nd century church fathers used a regular fide, the sacred traditions of the church, to deal with the heresies that cropped up among them. They didn't create a canon of books in order to deal with that heresy. But the Moratorian fragment does not fit a 2nd century context. That's my particular view. Uh, it's first known by Chromatius Aquila uh, in a tractate uh, on Matthew 398 to 407. And a part of the reason we know why uh, he uh, is quoting it is because he also says that uh, uh, Paul got his source of seven churches to write to from the book of Revelation. So he puts the book of Revelation earlier. 
anyhow, uh, we, both biblical scholars aren't too familiar with that uh, tradition, and they don't agree with it anyway. Uh, Hermas is one of the pivotal points in it. Hermas was a scripture in the second century. It's cited by Irenaeus as scripture. And several other early church fathers speak very, very highly of the text. But it was rejected as scripture, and specifically as scripture only, in the other examples that we have in the fourth century. Uh, Hermas is in Codex Sinaiticus, more copies of it than all of the other New Testament books except for the Gospels of Matthew and John, even Revelation. Uh, the epistle to the Laodiceans is mentioned in it as a, f a document forged in Paul's name. Now, Tertullian spoke of the epistle of Laodiceans that's found among the Marcion, uh, Marcionites, and he said that this was the letter of Paul to the Ephesians that Marcion also accepted. But that is not the one that was rejected. Did you know no one rejected the epistle to the Laodiceans until the late fourth century? Which is an interesting thing to, to uh, look at. And it was something that was uh, uh, forged in Paul's name. It's actually a collection of uh, scriptures from Paul, uh, especially from the book of Philippians. But uh, that emerges probably in the fourth century and it's rejected widely after the end of the fourth century and not before. Wisdom of Solomon is mentioned also in the Muratorian fragment. The Wisdom of Solomon is an Old Testament text. It's found in the Old Testaments for the Catholics uh, and the Orthodox churches. And it was looked upon as sacred scripture for a number of years, uh, even by Jews as well as by uh, the early Christians. But it's found in a New Testament collection, not an Old Testament collection. You say, wow, that's odd. Are there any parallels to that? Yes, it's found in Eusebius and Epiphanius in the fourth and late fourth century and early fifth century. So the parallels there, I think, are not something to be ignored. Uh, also, he mentions without any equivocation, second or third. He only mentions one extra uh, besides the first letter of John. He mentions two letters, but there's no question about it. But in the fourth century, early 4th century, you see Eusebius mentioning that not everybody accepted that, and uh, there's many doubts about the second and third epistles of John. There's also no defense of the four Gospels. In the second century, we have Irenaeus who's trying to uh, argue for four Gospels, these four and no more. You don't find any arguments for them, they're just stated. It's very much like the 4th century where Eusebius comes along and uh, book 3 and chapter 25 and he speaks about the holy tetrad everybody knows it's four and no more but that's not true Irenaeus gave nothing but all kinds of arguments in favor of those four and no more and then you have the brother uh, of uh, Hermas being pious a bishop of Rome that would make it roughly about 140 to 150 AD but there are no parallels to that reference until the fourth century but it also if it were true and Pius was a bishop at about 140 to 150 it would put the book closer to 140 to 150 than 180 and following the reason they put it 180 is because there's some later second century heresies that are mentioned in the uh, Muratorian fragment uh, the three examples oh and I mentioned the brother he's uh, Hermas is the brother called the brother of Pius did you know that there's no other examples of this what's called the fraternity legend in the Muratorian fragment until the late, uh, the middle to the late fourth century? And I list them here for you. I won't take the time to read and give some illustrations from them, but those are the earliest ones, and they're all fourth century uh, that give examples of that. Now, there's a couple of other odd things, and then I'll leave this. Uh, in the tailwind. If Hermas was written very recently in our times, as the text says, uh, then Pius was the Bishop of Rome, but that's way too early uh, for the text. The Cotafrigians, interestingly, the Cotafrigians, uh, do you know who they were? They were the Montanists. In the second century, they are called Montanists, the followers of Montanus. And uh, they are not called Cotafrigians until the 4th century. Eusebius says the so-called Cotafrigians in, uh, in his writings, 
But uh, Jerome later speaks of them very openly. It becomes a very common term, the Cataphrygians. But the term in the second century, not the fourth, was the Montanists uh, that followed, followed them. Miltiades also is listed as someone whose works you should always reject. Are you aware that Tertullian speaks with high favor of Miltiades in the second century? And also, so does Eusebius, who says he spoke against the heresies, the Gnostics, and the Jews. He praises him for his work. It's only at the end of the fourth century, early fifth century, where Miltiades is being called into question and you're told not to read any of his works. Is it a letter of a fraud? Uh, interestingly, there's a woman, Claire Rothschilds. I've spent a fair amount of time communicating with her on the internet, and I passed on uh, her paper to a couple of other folks that are coming out. Uh, John Mead, I don't know if John is here tonight, but John Mead and Ed Gallagher have an Oxford University Press book coming out on canons that'll be out the end of this year. And it's a wonderful, wonderful text. I've got some glimpses already of what they've got in it. But they highlight this also. But Claire Rothschild has a book coming out with uh, Wundt in the Moore Zebeck uh, collection at the end of this year. And she says that it was written in, uh, in the fourth century to try to justify us, uh, that text, that list of books where it has all of its parallels. And uh, it was written in the name of, uh, or in the date of the second century. It's, so it cites all of these other items, where it, whether it's Hermas uh, and the brother of Pius and Miltiades and the uh, Cartophrygians, all of those things that I mentioned that it's written to try to fool other people. Is that possible? Well, of course it was. There's all kinds of pseudonymous writings that were circulating in the second, third, and fourth centuries uh, in the churches. Okay, my conclusion is that the Muratorian Fragment is a late fourth century document produced to seek a second century support for a fourth century list. It was written in the second century and it had no influence before the late fourth or early fifth century thought. The second century is not dealing with a canon of books, it's listing a canon of faith, the Regula Fidei, and it uses that to distinguish uh, itself from uh, uh, heresy in the second and third centuries. They focused on that rule of faith. The Bible in the early church. There was no Bible in the early church. The term itself did not exist for the collection of sacred scriptures until much later. The first person to use it, uh, Bible comes from the plural Biblos, uh, ta Biblia, and it simply uh, refers to books. That's the plural of it. Jerome used it of the books, and he was speaking of the sacred books and sacred books, eventually we began to talk about the holy books. And so you have holy Bible. I have holy Bible up here. And that term didn't become uh, common in the churches until after the ninth century. It's becoming a little bit more popular when they were able to put all of the books of the Bible in one volume. And then it becomes even more popular in the 11th and 12th centuries when the Pandek Bibles the Pandak meanings, the whole corpus of the books of the Bible were put in one volume. And interestingly, some of those volumes were not much bigger than this. They found a way to press the animal skins into something almost like thin paper. And if you want to see what one looks like, go over to the Bible Museum. They've got a couple of them over there. It's great stuff. And they, you say, now how did they do that? The print is so small. And I was talking to Diane, the director over there, and I said, the way they did that was they were doing, there was a new invention in the 11th century, it's called the magnifying glass, and they used the magnifying glass to write in very small letters along the way. And uh, they produced all of those handwritten Bibles, remarkable skills. The Bible is not a book until the 11th, 12th century. The regular use of the Bible, 11th, 12th, uh, the term Bible, 11th, 12th centuries in the Pandek Bibles, also called the Paris Bibles, where those were used for uh, students in university, clergy, and professors. The New Testament uh, texts, none of them were called scripture before the second century. And uh, the New Testament writers regularly cite New, uh, Old Testament texts. You know that. They're always called, as the scripture says, or as it is written, or uh, it is written. Uh, those kinds of terms are used 
but never of New Testament text in any book of the New Testament. That's uh, or where the authors don't make those kinds of statements about themselves. And that's where it's going to lead me to another point here. In the fourth century, there was broad agreement on most of the books of the New Testament, but not on all of them. Uh, Revelation and Second Peter, that was quite of a uh, struggle for those books to find complete uh, acceptance. The New Testament canon developed some New Testament writings called Scripture. This is summary uh, by 130 to 150. Let me share with you where I'm going to go. There's a group of scholars that think that the New Testament authors wrote Holy Scripture. Consciously, they consciously produced it. And I have been looking at their arguments and they clobber me badly because I don't recognize that when I say it's really second century when they start to be called uh, sacred scripture. Have you the awareness of writing scripture? All right. Recent scholars who say that the New Testament writers were consciously, consciously aware of writing scripture when they wrote, they cite a number of texts, but they also confuse inspiration. Inspiration was never the criterion for canonicity. It was a corollary. If, if it was scripture, it was automatically understood to be inspired. But did you know that the earliest Christians up through the 5th century, there's a wonderful doctoral dissertation on it at Harvard uh, by Everett Kalin, that uh, uh, inspiration was never reserved for the books uh, of the Bible alone. It was when a person preached in the power of the Spirit. They didn't distinguish the inspiration from one to the other. The Apostle Paul used it in reference to his preaching primarily. His gospel was what was given to him by revelation and he speaks about in the various texts that are, that are used, he speaks about it as that which God had revealed to him. It's either a revelation, uh, but it's his letters, I'm sorry, not his letters, but the gospel that he preached to them. He doesn't say it's his letters that are inspired in the same way. Now, uh, if all inspiration texts, uh, if all inspiration texts are scripture, then we've lost a lot of scriptures because Clement himself, 1 Clement chapter 47, verse 3, uh, he acknowledges that Paul wrote scripture. He was moved by inspiration to write. But he later says, so was I. So should we add the uh, Clementine literature, 1 Clement, to the scriptural text? Actually, many did up till about the 11th, 12th century A.D. But also, uh, Ignatius uh, speaks about uh, how other writings are inspired, but so are his. I've got a bunch of texts to share with you, but I'm, let me just share the, uh, some of the texts that they use. They're evidence. In 1 Corinthians 14, 37, Paul says, Anyone who claims to be a prophet or have spiritual powers must acknowledge that what I am saying about the gift of prophecy and how it's to be used in the church, that's a summary, he said, they must acknowledge that what I am writing to you is a command of the Lord. Okay? So people have said, see there, what Paul said is a command of the Lord. Just go back a couple of chapters, and Paul says, to the married I give this command, not I but the Lord, that the wife should, be, uh, should not separate from her husband. And he goes on. But verse 12 he says, now, the, to the rest, I say, not I, but, uh, he says, uh, to the rest, I say, and not the Lord. The Lord doesn't say this. I say this. And in verse 25 of that chapter, he says, now concerning the virgins, I have no command of the Lord. So how do we distinguish in the Corinthian letters? We had the commands of the Lord, and Paul wanted authority. But people are using 1 Corinthians 14, 37 as a text to say that everything that Paul wrote was a command of the Lord. But he's already telling us, I don't have a command of the Lord on this. He mentions it twice. In uh, verse 25, concerning the virgins, I have no command of the Lord, but I give my own opinion. And he concludes that chapter, verse 40, and I think I have the Spirit on this. That doesn't sound too sure-sured to uh, people that say, you think... I've had professors that shot me down when I gave an answer and said, well, I think. Well, I don't care what you think. I want to know what you know. Anyhow, uh, they confused Paul's gospel with his letters because Paul never once calls his letters scripture. Never once. 
and they've also transferred whatever they thought was true in Paul's letters over to all of the other books of the New Testament which do not make such a claim as well. Uh, and I mentioned a key text, it's a uh, 2 Corinthians 11:16 to 18, I repeat, let no one think that I'm a fool. He's been boasting. But he said, but if you do, then accept me as a fool, so that I too may boast a little. What I'm saying in regard to this boastful confidence, I am saying not with the Lord's authority. The Greek in here is katakurion, not according to the Lord. Paul said he was, what he was saying was not according to the Lord. But then in the next verse he said, but I'm speaking as a fool. And verse 18, since many boast according to human standards, that's kata sarka, according to the flesh, uh, I will also boast. And he goes on. If you go on to chapter 12, which I won't uh, do here, uh, Paul speaks about what true boasting is uh, and it's boasting in the Lord and what the Lord has done. Chapter 12, verses 11, 12, and 13. You can check it out on your own. Now, let me see. Uh, whoops, I've already done that. Uh, the Apostle Paul also doesn't seem to be uh, one who is inspired by God to write sacred scripture, and he doesn't use the phrases like the uh, the prophets in the Old Testament say, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, and here it is, it's a revelation from God. But in chapter 1, verse 14 of 1 Corinthians, uh, anyhow, the, uh, he says in anger, I thank you, I thank God I didn't baptize any of you, except Crispus and Gaius. And uh, I didn't baptize any of you. And then he corrects himself in verse 16, oh yes, the household of Stephanus, and I don't know if I baptized any others. Does that sound like a person who is writing inspired scripture or some revelation from God? Galatians 5.12 is one of those interesting texts where he's really mad at the people that have been upsetting his churches in Galatia. And he wishes that they would castrate themselves. He's madder than a hornet at them. Anyway, it's not the, the regular kind of pious thing. Paul seems unaware that he is consciously writing scripture and he never once claims to have written scripture. I agree with the church that what Paul was, wrote was scripture, but it took us almost a hundred years to figure that out. It took a little bit of time. Okay, the, no one else did that for almost a hundred years, accused the New Testament writers of writing scripture. The later church fathers did, I think they got it right, but we should honor also those who did write the New Testament. No author ever calls his writings scripture, and the only one who comes the closest is the book of Revelation, as I mentioned to you, it was the last book to be accepted, and people fought over it forever. If they intended to write scripture, why didn't they say it once in a while? And also, why did it take a hundred years for the rest of the church to figure it out? Paul's authority to write was based not on his inspiration, by the way, but you'll see it at the beginning of his letters, it was based on his apostleship. Paul, an apostle, not of uh, man, but of Jesus Christ. Uh, not by man or the will of man, Galatians chapter 1, verse 1, and so on, uh, but by the, the will of God. Uh, anyhow, uh, he preached his gospel by inspiration. And he mentions that in 1 Thessalonians 1, 5 to 6. He my, reminds the Thessalonian Christians, when I came to you, I was led by the power of the Spirit and I preached the gospel. That was his, his witness. He does not accept uh, the claim for his own letters except for possibly 1 Corinthians 7.40 that I cited where he comes closest to it and he says, I think I have the Spirit. <laughs> and uh, what I, the advice I've given to the wives, uh, to the widows, and uh, to the virgins. Anyhow, uh, the earliest list of the New Testament text, and I'm just about done here, uh, Irenaeus is one of the uh, earliest with the four Gospels. Origen, in the third century, he does list books, but he's almost a century ahead of his time. There's nobody else that's doing this until Eusebius in the fourth century. Athanasius, in the later fourth century, uh, uh, lists the New Testament books in his 39th Festal Letter. The Councils of Hippo, Carthage, and uh, 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 there's two at Carthage, 397, and uh, 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 397 and 416, they come very close to the same New Testament uh, Augustine had that was, uh, I'm sorry, that Athanasius had that Augustine also approved. And uh, the uh, canon of uh, 
the Council of Laodicea had the books. It actually wasn't written the earlier in 360, as some had supposed, but uh, when it lists its books, it comes out probably between 367 and 400. We can't date it precisely, but it doesn't have the uh, book of Revelation. Trent, of course, in 1547, epistle uh, uh, to Laodicea in Western churches, 900 years in the German and English uh, churches, 3rd Corinthians, for over a thousand years in many of the Catholic tradition as well as the Arminian tradition. The canon was fluid for many centuries. That's the point I want to make. But there were many Christians throughout church history that accepted all of those books that we have in our New Testament. That's why we have them today. That's why they have survived. Um, the medieval Bibles, I'm just going to go through this. I've already mentioned the Pandek Bibles and so on. Third Corinthians continued for a while. These are some of the areas. The artifacts of canon uh, formation are often neglected where people do not consider them as much, I think, as they should. Now, the Nomina Sacra, there's a group of scholars that say every, the Nomina Sacra are abbreviations. You'll often see, like some of you have pulpits that have I, H, S, and a line over the top. That's an abbreviation, a Nomina Sacra for Jesus. The most common ones were Jesus, God, uh, Son, Holy Spirit. There's over 15 of them that eventually were used, and you'll find them in New Testament manuscripts for a period of time. And so uh, Hurtado and Kruger and Bocadal and Larry, yeah, Larry Hurtado say that that indicates that the books that were written were called Scripture, or recognized as Scripture. But uh, uh, Christopher Tuckett and Anna Marie Leyendijk, who've done an extensive study of the, these as well, have shown that these nomina sacra show up in Christian writings whether or not they were looked upon as Scripture. And so there's a number of these texts that have nothing to do with our biblical books, but uh, they were written clearly by uh, Christians. Uh, let me just go back. Uh, the lectionaries, this is one of the most neglected items, and I shared this when I was at Princeton with the students, uh, uh, Jim, that one of the most neglected studies in canon formation are the lectionaries. They begin roughly in the fourth and fifth centuries, those are the scriptures that were read in the churches. If you want to know what books everybody thought was Bible, there you've got it. They didn't have all of the books of the Bible, but over the course of a year or so, you begin to see those collections. They're quite significant. The first complete manuscripts of the New Testament, 9th, 10th century, the older translations don't have all of the books that are in ours as well. Biblical authority, initially, uh, the church's focus was on the authority of Scripture, but not the scope of Scripture. When they began to recognize the Christian books as Scripture, they didn't say these books and not those books off over there. The focus was eventually on books that were reflecting the church's sacred traditions, the Regula Fidei. The apostolic authority gains prominence in the mid-2nd century, and the pseudonymous text circulated in the church for quite some period of time, writings written in another person's name, and they were excluded consciously by the fourth century, some a little bit earlier. And the New Testament has a powerful story, folks, and I want to conclude on telling you, go out and preach it. It actually works. I shared with the students last night that I've said for years, the seminary students, the reason I preach the gospel is that it works. It transforms lives. For pity's sake, get out there and share it. I have no problems with people wanting to do Christian apologetics. That's okay. But it will not bring people into a right relationship with God through Christ until the gospel itself is shared. In the wisdom of God, God chose to save the world not through the folly, I'm sorry, not through the wisdom of the world, 1 Corinthians 1, but through the folly of what we preach that was foolishness to the Greeks, it was a stumbling block to the Jews, but to those who are being saved, it's the power of God unto salvation. We have a gospel that needs to be shared, and you find that gospel proclaimed in our scriptures. Again, and this is the le very last slide, canon is an authority or a rule. There is no such thing as a biblical canon without accepting the authority of that canon. You can't claim to have a biblical canon if you don't submit to its authority. Historically, canon dealt with books, however, and not the text. And that's another generation where we're working on it, and we've had text-critical scholars trying to get to the original text. We're not there yet for the Old Testament or the New. Do you know how many variants are in the biblical manuscripts? 
There's over 900,000 in the Old Testament manuscripts, variants, differences. In the New Testament manuscripts, conservatively, people say 200,000. Eckhart Schnabel says 300,000. Bert Ehrman says 400,000. There's quite a few. I haven't looked at all of them, but I know quite a few of them. Uh, no biblical or theological argument is made to close the canon, but there is a historical one, and that historical uh, argument is essentially that the early church wanted to anchor its New Testament scriptures in the time of Jesus in the apostolic tradition, and Mark and Luke were looked upon as within that apostolic tradition. Again, go preach the gospel. It really does work. We've got scriptures that uh, we can find to be worthy of our time, our attention, our study, and what God has for us uh, in His Word will be transformative in our lives and the lives of those with whom we share it. Thank you very much for letting me come. All right, here's the first question, and is this, it's for either Dr. McDonald or Dr. Charlesworth. What are your thoughts on the validity or canonicity of the Protevangelium of James, and of course you know what that, what's in that. Which would you like, Jim? Yeah. I, I spoke on that when I, referring to Professor Zervos, uh, he is now uh, working on 140 manuscripts of this text. He has been able to show that the text is early second century and may go back to traditions that are very close to 70, and that's when I referred to Mary dancing in the temple. Uh, and she was a virgin in the temple, and none of us thought that uh, this text existed, but he was able to uh, find it there, and now archaeologists are saying, from our study of the temple, when it was there in the seven, up into 70, there were virgins uh, celebrating. Now, maybe dancing is not the word you would use, joyfully praising the Lord. Thank you very much. Here's a question now addressed to Dr. McDonald. What criteria were used to begin eliminating books from the Bible, resulting in the accepted Bible in use today? Okay. Thank the criteria that were used, essentially, uh, uh, apostolicity, if it was believed that an apostle wrote the text, it was accepted. And there were some that we weren't sure if the apostle, apostle wrote it, an apostle wrote it, but it was accepted for a period of time. Some were questioned, like Second Peter, but uh, its initial acceptance, and then its doubts because of that particular issue. Uh, the second issue has to do with uh, antiquity. Those writings that were written closest to the time of Jesus are those that were uh, most likely to be accepted. The second century and third century churches wanted to anchor their faith in the Jesus uh, uh, in Jesus and those that were closest to him. And Mark and Luke, of course, were not uh, apostles, but they were closest and learned from them. The third is what uh, we call Catholicity, uh, I'm sorry, not Catholicity, but Orthodoxy, Proto-Orthodoxy. Did the writings fit with that which had been handed on in tradition? Uh, if a text said that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, it was zapped. If it didn't say that he died on the cross for our sins, that was at the heart of the Christian confession. It was zapped. And there's texts like that that wouldn't say that and denied it. Uh, then the fourth one was what we call Catholicity or use, widespread use. And Eusebius used this, and so did the origin. He said that those books, those books that were widely used in the, check, uh, the, the churches were the ones that were most recognized and therefore most likely to be canon. And the fifth one, and it's a friend of uh, ours and a former professor of uh, uh, Craig's at Claremont, James Sanders spoke about adaptability. There were some texts that served the needs of the churches for a period of time that then they no longer did, and they just fell off of the screen. They were not adaptable to new and changing circumstances in the life of the congregations. Eventually, when the books were uh, process and said these books are in, then hermeneutics been, began to come in and find new ways to say how relevant the text was, and sometimes they showed that uh, uh, the conclusions, those hermeneutics interpretations of the text came up with interpretations the original authors never intended, but that's how that was done. So adaptability, Find though, was very re relevant.
Here are two questions. They're both closely related, and they're both for Dr. Charlesworth. Part, <laughs> part one, can you speak of some of the problems with the text you said would could be added as an appendix to scripture such as the Gospel of Thomas. Now let me continue with the next question. The Gospel of Thomas teaches that females must make themselves males in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. Since you are in favor of adding this text <laughs> as an appendix to the canon, do you believe that this is an authentic saying of Jesus? This is all yours. <laughs> we know from studying the Dead Sea Scrolls, from some studying Jesus, the end of time will be a return to the beginning of time. Now, where did Eve come from? Adam. So that the woman will become the man again, and that will be an androgynous being that was fully formed and fully in love with God. So it has nothing to do with... <laughs> Uh, hatred of women. It has a return to the, uh, the wonderful, pristine time. And thank you for asking me what I have in my hand. Yes. Uh, oh, so hold on. Yeah. Uh, I would say that I would not read that text in my church. I'd be stoned. Anyway. This next question. what you drink then. Yeah. Next question for Dr. McDonald. Now, this is an interesting question. Who wrote the Nicene Creed? Did Emperor Constantine have anything to do with it? Well, the Nicene Creed didn't deal with books. It dealt with, and I had one of the slides to talk about the importance of Nicene, and they dealt with the identity of Jesus. And the bishops came together at the uh, uh, instigation of Constantine. And they worked for a period of time trying to determine the identity of Jesus. I would have said in the slide that uh, there would have been no New Testament canon had there been no agreement on the identity of Jesus. How could you have a New Testament canon without some broad agreement on who Jesus was? So uh, Constantine constituted that, uh, that uh, council, but Constantine didn't say what the outcome had to be. But he agreed with it once the bishops agreed with it. Very good. Now, here it is, the question we've been waiting for tonight. I'm not making this up. I'm reading it right off the card. Okay, what was the non-canon book that Jesus quoted, Professor Charlesworth, in your lecture? Also, what is in the box? <laughs> Lee, would you hand me the box? Uh, no, I'd hand you the answer to the question, but if you want, but <laughs> is it down the here? The parables of Enoch, who has the box? <laughs> Ah. <laughs> what I have here, no one knows about. Emmanuel Tove, all of them. And uh, they are two inkwells from Qumran. Here is one, and I've been studying it. This is a little over 2,000 years old. Oh. <laughs> When I'm with the Arabs, they'll say, this is a priceless antiquity. And I said, you want to see two pieces of, two, uh, uh, pieces of antiquity? <laughs> this lip, the ink would go here. And you know, if you knocked it over, uh, the ink would come out and ruin everything you've done. What if it took you 20 years to do what you've been copying? You would have to throw it all out. So this lip keeps the ink in. See, it comes up here, but it's hollow beginning here. The, the ink is in here. So this is an inkwell. Uh, this is 70% from Qumran. Uh, this one is 100% from Qumran. Uh, this was bought sometime between 52 and 56. You, you, they wanted to uh, look at these for your, your image. Have you got it okay? He's got a mic on. Please. Okay. Uh, if you have studied what an inkwell from Qumran looks like, this is it. <clears throat> and uh, this was uh, purchased by a man that had in his private collection from about 1952 until a couple of years ago when I started buying his collection. 
And he said, it's clearly from Qumran, and there's no doubt it's from Qumran. And uh, if, if you say that uh, how many inkwells were found at Qumran, the scholars uh, no, don't know. Uh, if you ask what did the archaeologists found, they didn't find anything. The, the Bedouin were digging. So they said the Bedouin would bring us one. And when they said, oh, this is invaluable, the next one went into a garment and appeared uh, in, in uh, other places. Uh, I estimate there may have been as many as eight inkwells in the scriptorium. And if you find one inkwell in a house, uh, it's very, very rare. But there's no doubt Qumran is where they were composing uh, scrolls. We call them the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, that means they were found not by us. Only Cave 3 was found uh, by my teacher, DeVoe, and he showed me what he found in it. We went into the cave, but he did not know, nor do anybody know, and this is part of my collection. I have over 5,000 antiquities that I've collected uh, since the early 60s. Uh, uh, and I just wanted you to see it, because what I showed you is 2,000 years ago, and when you see a Dead Sea Scroll, you can say, I actually saw an inkwell, and the ink is more valuable. I'm now working on how you date ink because we have uninscribed leather. Oh, they can't hear me. No, you've got your mic on. You, you, they're, they're, you're fine. <laughs> Obviously, you know I've been doing this since I was a little kid, and my dad had a big church, and. Uh, I, I, I feel very much at home in, in front of 2,400 people. Uh, of course, some of them are uh, over in other places. Um, to me, it's very exciting. I've seen uninscribed leather, and I told uh, a Bedouin, it's worthless. He said, why? Because there's no ink on it. I think that was the piece I saw 30 years later with ink on it. And you, you, you say, why would he do that? He was willing to sell it for $250,000. So I'm trying to, I have over 48 inkwells, and now I have two more, and we're studying the ink, how was the ink made, and we have some discoveries you cannot believe, and I can't share it with you yet, uh, but we will now be able to tell you how the ink was made, and we could date the writing, not the leather. The uh, AMS C14, the, the mass spectrometer that gives you the dating uh, of an animal when it died. You're not interested in the leather, you're interested in the ink. And the people that put the ink there were more fundamental than any of you. This is God's word. The ink contains God's word. So you begin to see how important this is. There is ink in these inkwells. Thank you very much, Professor Charlesworth. I'm going to come back to you in just a minute with a follow-up question. Dr. McDonald, have you discerned any geographical tendencies in canon views? various places within the church, here or there, east, west, Egypt, as opposed to Greece, I suppose, or Asia Minor, different views in different regions relating to contents of canon? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, you'll find a different collection of scriptures uh, on some of the fringes of those circulating in the west than in the churches in the east. Uh, the eastern churches, the Orthodox churches, never had a Council of Trent. And the Protestants didn't either. And initially, the uh, Protestants were welcoming the, uh, uh, in the West, they were welcoming the apocryphal or deuterocanonical books. And uh, that, uh, you'll find that in the earliest editions of the King James Bible. And then eventually it was taken out. And uh, by 1850, very few other Bibles were still circulating those. The Ethiopian Christians, again, we mentioned them in Ethiopia, had a different collection of scriptures. The Armenian Christians uh, north of Syria had a uh, slightly different one. And there are several texts that are found in the Ethiopian canon that uh, nobody else has. Uh, the Sunados, which is really a collection of the 
the prescripts that were brought together and brought to bear in several of the councils from 325 and following, those were included in the sacred uh, scriptures of the Arminians. I don't, am I answering the question or did I miss it? Yeah, yeah. okay. Thank you very much. Now this, uh, this question is for Professor Charlesworth. We all heard just a few weeks ago about Cave 12, didn't we? That made news, and if I may, at the risk of sounding boastful, I wrote a piece that was posted on Fox News opinion page, co-authored with Jeremiah Johnston. We, had, we, we, along with a few others, broke this news. Now, you know what's interesting? That post was watched or, or visited and read by many times more people than, than read Bill O'Reilly's post or Sean Hannity's. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Now, that tells me, and that was a huge surprise to the editor of the Fox Opinion webpage. But I, I wasn't surprised. People have a hunger for things relating to the Bible, the origins of the Christian faith. And everybody here could attest to that. Well, look at you. This play overflow crowd to hear about the canon of Scripture, Dead Sea Scrolls conferences. And we've all been at these as speakers and so on, invariably. It's packed to the gills. Now, in light of this discovery of Cave 12, the question for Professor Charlesworth is this. Is it possible that we'll find another cave or two, perhaps another trove of documents, maybe even a New Testament writing or a Pauline autograph? I have found many caves. cave is north of the other caves. I have to be very ambiguous. And when you climb up, you can find a first century wall that was built. It's a huge cave, it's at least from here to there. Uh, and uh, there is evidence that you have clearly today a dry waterfall. That means that often during the year, water pours off the hills and down, and you can see where stones were in a semicircle for a good while. So this is a, a cave that we should dig, but there are many, many others I know about. My teacher DeVoe found over a thousand caves, but he said you don't have a Qumran cave until you find a writing in it. Uh, so it's just the lack of money. Uh, to, there are many caves that, and I've been going there since uh, DeVoe took me there in 1968, before any of you were born. <laughs> Except for Chris. Uh, so, yeah, there, there, there are many more things to find. Uh, we are going to find the huge library at uh, Hatsor. We know it was the head of the Canaanite Amphictyony, and uh, we will find the library because the last time a, a, a writing was found, uh, they were sitting having lunch and someone kicks something, and he says, oh, it's from the library. And it's, of course, a cuneiform tablet. Where is the library? So if you think the great discoveries have been made, I'm after some whole scrolls. Uh, and uh, we talked about the Ethiopian canon. It contains the books of Enoch. It contains the parables of Enoch. It contains Jude that quotes as scripture or as prophecy, the book of Enoch. And uh, we thought it was a medieval composition, and now we know we have copies of Enoch, the book of Enoch, from the time of Herod the Great and all the way back to 300 BCE. It's some of our oldest writings among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, I am so pleased that you're excited. Stay excited. And uh, stay close to Charles because uh, he uh, is a good man. And, uh, I, think, uh, I do want to say one last thing to you. Yes, there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of variants, but we have over 35,000 New Testaments. And uh, what I would say to you, not as a Methodist minister, because you say, I, he's confessing. There is nothing that we consider in the Bible that's absolutely essential for our salvation 
that is in any one changed by any manuscript. That has been preserved perfectly. Now, those who make confession say that is the Holy Spirit we get the Bible and we can trust the Bible, maybe not a little bit here, maybe not a little bit there, but the whole is all you need to be forgiven and to be saved. And one day we will walk the streets of heaven together and you will say, you know, weren't you a Methodist once? <laughs>